Uh, today, our first speaker is Chris Schindler. Now, um, I first met Chris in 2001. Um, Chris is the type of guy that you refer to as a jack of all trades on the drop zone. So, you know, I recall on a busy weekend in the summertime, get to the hangar, 7.30, Chris is there having coffee and breakfast and chatting away, getting ready for his first jump. As the day progresses, we get the call, we need to start up the second otter or the third office otter. So Chris is on the PA, come and fly another couple of loads for us. Chris gets up there, floats a couple of loads, turns down the otter, shuts down the otter. Chris, we need you to do a couple of tandems for us. Chris comes and throws a couple of drogues. And then at the end of the day, you see him dirt diving to be on the big way sunset load. Um, so, so Chris has kind of, he's, he's done a bit of everything. Um, about 3,000 hours of jump flying, is that right, Chris? Right, yeah, yeah 3,000 hours yeah. flying jumpers itself. Yeah, so a little bit of experience there. Um, he now works for a, a major airline in the US. Uh, he is the founder of DiverDriver.com, which is a, a great little website kind of dedicated to jump pilots and things like that. Um, and today, I believe we're going to talk about jump run emergencies. Um, we've also got Mark Edwards here, as most of you should know, is our National Aviation Officer. Um, Mark's a wealth of knowledge as well. Um, he also works for a major airline in Australia, a big uh, red and white one. Uh, all right, so I shall hand this over to you, Chris. And if anyone has any questions, chat or just kind of put your hand up and I think it's just going to be a, a pretty informal chat, this one. So the uh, ball's in your court, Chris. All right, thanks. I appreciate uh, being invited for uh, this meeting. I uh, apologize for the funny accent at this point. Uh, Wade and I had a lot of years of working together there at Scott Air Chicago in uh, uh, Illinois. And uh, so we, we got used to each other. But uh, if there's anything that doesn't come across as an understandable, please, you know, stop me, ask questions. Um, Wade uh, said that this is somewhat informal and we can talk about uh, jump run emergencies. Uh, I've just written a article in a conjunction with or, uh, uh, with uh, the help of uh, Annette O'Neill for United States Parachute Association. So it's a, a recent topic uh, for us uh, with everything having been grounded. Uh, I'm not sure the status of Australia, if parts of Australia are jumping yet or not. Uh, we seem to have uh, things opening up. So uh, things are getting back to uh, normal here in the United States. And obviously we're just at the beginning of our season uh, getting things going. Uh, so um, a lot of uh, the advice I've given, you know, my bona fides I actually started in skydiving in uh, 1995, uh, flying at a Cessna drop zone uh, for a couple years and uh, moved up to, uh, Twin Otters uh, for uh, full time for uh, the next couple of years, and then I was part time, as Wade was describing, uh, for many years after that. So about ten years total of flying skydivers, uh, three thousand hours turbine aircraft, piston aircraft, and in the late nineties, I had a uh, personal experience, a, a drop zone I fl had flown at, but I had left. Uh, had a fatal Cessna 206 crash, and uh, I began uh, voicing my opinion that uh, things could be better in the United States. In 1997, there were 21 jump plane accidents in a single year, um, and since that time in the United States, last year we had four. Um, unfortunately, one of which was fatal, and it uh, took the lives of 11 people in Hawaii. Um, my website, DiverDriver.com, is centered around United States uh, statistics and regulations, but a lot of the advice can be applied um, broadly. Um, in the beginning of running the website, I got a, uh, a lot of emails from people 
uh, outside of the United States, which was very interesting and unexpected to me. Uh, many parts of the world, they didn't have any regulations, advice, or guidance. Um, some of which was similar to the United States in the late 90s, mid 90s. Uh, each drop zone was a tribe unto themselves. And um, you flew by folklore and legend and myth uh, without much uh, standard operating. Um, so I began speaking out and it was a hard sell at first. Uh, people hung on to their, uh, what they were familiar with for a long time. But it's changed over the last 20 years uh, that we've been running the website. And obviously the influence has been there. Uh, people have bought in and we've changed how things are run, but it's always good to have new articles and fresh information. Um, so, you know, speaking from this article, uh, I talked about first, you know, be belted in when you're supposed to be belted in and helmets, you know, worn are best. Uh, if not clipped around uh, part of the harness chest strap. Um, and, you know, those things, if we come to a sudden stop, it, uh, we want things to be secured. That's pretty obvious. Um, you know, when I trained to become a skydiver, all of my training was the emergencies with a parachute, how the gear worked, and very little was done on what if something really bad happened in the airplane other than just listen to the pilot? Well, if you're in a twin otter and you're sitting in the back, you're not going to hear the pilot. The word has to be passed down, but the word that the pilot gives should make sense in some way, uh, some way, some manner. So having these conversations now can be uh, really important. Uh, so obviously seated where you're supposed to be seated, belted, with a tight belt so that you can't go anywhere and consider which direction you're facing as you're belted in. Um, sometimes your jump run may be before the jump run you expected. Uh, an emergency happens soon after takeoff. Uh, what altitude is that happening at? We typically talk about the uh, engine failure in a single engine. Oop, little feedback there. A single engine airplane, um, what altitude are you at and whether you're going to get out uh, right then. And it comes down to what type of skydive are you doing? Are you an experienced skydiver? Are you closest to the door? Are you a student skydiver and further from the door? And again, are you doing a tandem or some other jump uh, wing suiting? These things need to be a topic of conversation um, so that everyone's on the same page. And I'm not going to tell you that my opinion on something is, you know, the hard and fast rule, but I hope this begins the discussion if it hasn't happened already, or the discussion becomes more detailed uh, where you're jumping. And so that everyone has a clear view on what should be done and when no emergency ever presents like the book tells you about. It's, it's always gonna look different. But if you have had a lot of conversations about what to do and when to do it, uh, it can help you figure out the in-between scenarios and have hopefully a, a successful outcome or as successful as you can be. Um, when we talk about jump run in an emergency, you know, engine failure right after takeoff, uh, single engine airplane, uh, I, I'm going to talk in feet, not meters, sorry. Uh, you get to 1,500 feet, uh, that might be the first time that you actually consider getting out of an airplane. That's because there's the startle factor. There's the, is this going to get better time? The amount of time you're deciding, hey, can this be fixed? No, we're actually starting to descend. Is the plane in control? By the time all of that happens, you're losing altitude. And, you know, our first topic of discussion is piston engines, and they're fairly simple situations, you know, push the nose over, start to glide, maintain airspeed. Where things become exotic 
is the prevalence, especially in the United States, of these single engine turbine aircraft. We are now seeing instances of engine failure in caravans, uh, especially the souped up uh, high power caravans, that they are having engine failures and it is happening so fast because you begin with such a high deck angle in the climb that deciding and acting on getting the nose down is, is something that has to be instantaneous and it's not necessarily happening. And the pilots become uh, task saturated and may not fully uh, perform their emergency procedures. Namely, they're not getting the propeller feathered reducing the drag and that costs uh, quite a bit of altitude so if you're in a single engine uh, caravan pack 750 uh, you know even uh, Pilatus Porter if they are still being used in Australia uh, it can be um, a, a different dynamic than just a single engine piston aircraft uh, we had an instance in California where a carav caravan lost an engine somewhere around 3,000 feet, nearly on the downwind of uh, the traffic pattern. Uh, and the pilot never feathered the propeller, which caused a lot of drag. And video from inside the cabin showed that they were descending somewhere around 1,500 feet per minute. Had the propeller been feathered, the rate of descent would have decreased tremendously and they might have been able to glide back to the runway and actually very likely uh, the propeller was never feathered until they got very close to touchdown in a grass field they they landed you know mains down not stalled uh, and overran the end of the runway now that they did feather it close to the ground now the drag is taken away and they're off to the races, uh, covering a lot of ground with a little drag. Uh, so it was almost one of those, okay, you made the mistake to begin with, but then you compounded the mistake by your actions being late. Um, they ran over the top of a road at the end of the field, struck a truck, uh, went into a uh, vineyard, uh, which has steel wires and steel poles, flipped the aircraft over, and uh, came to a stop. Everyone got out. Uh, it seemed as though the pilot took the worst of it with a uh, bloody nose. And uh, from video inside the cabin, uh, it was seen that the pilot wasn't wearing a shoulder strap. It was neatly folded in the keeper up next to his head. Um, you know, so when I, when I start with, hey, strap in your helmets, wear your helmets, wear your seatbelts, you know, we, we sometimes have to remind pilots of the same thing. If there's a shoulder strap, utilize it because, uh, you know, you are not going to have time. Uh, you're going to be task saturated and you need to be ready. As we say to people getting on the airplane, put your rig on as if you're getting out of the plane in the next 10 seconds. Uh, you're not going to have time. No emergency ever ask your permission to happen. It's going to happen when you don't expect it, you will be startled uh, and you will not have time to correct a lot of things. So some assumptions have to be made. You have to be ready. So single engine piston, single engine uh, turbine aircraft, that's kind of the uh, discussions you should be having uh, at your drop zone with your equipment. Twin engine aircraft, uh, sometimes they will climb on one engine. Sometimes they won't. Uh, it can depend on the weight of the aircraft at that point, how well the aircraft was maintained, um, how it's being flown. And it can come down to the uh, quality training of, of the pilot. Um, I have had three force landings in single engine airplanes, and I have had uh, engine out situations uh, three times in multi-engine aircraft, uh, one in a DC-3, once in a Twin Otter, and uh, once at the uh, airline I was flying with. So uh, all twin-engine uh, 
uh, events have uh, land ended with landing on a runway. <laughs> the uh, three single engine force landings I had, uh, one of which ended up on a runway, the other two were in grass, but uh, no bent metal. Uh, so I can speak to the uh, psychological, physiological uh, response during an event like that as a pilot. It happens now. It doesn't ask your permission, and you can't negotiate it with it. You just have to have had training and thought through things uh, and practice. Um, the one Twin Otter engine out I had, uh, 6,000 feet. I ended up climbing to 7,000 feet by the time I got back to the airport. Uh, it ended up being fairly uh, innocuous, uh, but I was very glad that I had a lot of altitude to begin with. Uh, that can reduce uh, a lot of your stress and so that you, you act uh, with more uh, deliberate action, more thought than you might low to the ground. We had a Twin Otter with only I believe it was eight people on board uh, in uh, Missouri, uh, United States. Take off, never got above about 50 feet and ended up hitting a pole with one of the wings, which drilled it into the ground, ended up being a, a fatal accident with a, a few survivors. Uh, but everyone thinks a Twin Otter, well, it'll climb on one engine, only if it's flown properly. And the pilot chose uh, to do an intersection departure, did not use the full length of the runway. Um, hey, I'm light. I've only got eight people, seven jumpers maybe. And that was the time the engine failure happened. Um, so he reduced his margins. The engine failure happened and it had a very negative outcome. Um, and that was one where even as much as we have expounded upon the use of seat belts and restraints on takeoff, you know, they never got above 50 feet and yet the restraints were not used properly and it, it killed several people that could have survived because the people in the back of the plane used the people in the front of the plane as their deceleration pad. Uh, one of the survivors uh, who became a uh, paraplegic um, had a difficult time with that situation afterwards, considering that he really should have known better and uh, didn't wear the restraint uh, as tightly as he could have because, well, that was just a little inconvenient right then, but that's right when it happens. So it's really important to take it serious on every load, every time, because we don't know when that time's going to be. So talking about jump run emergencies at the typical jump altitude, first thing that comes to mind, premature deployments. Uh, what if that happens? And first for the jump pilot, obviously my, my website, I, I am pilot centric, uh, just skydivers, but I am mostly uh, here for uh, discussing pilot issues. But um, if you're in any type of airplane, that a premature deployment can go over the horizontal stabilizer, the pilot should be wearing an emergency bailout rig. In the United States, there's often paperwork that will uh, compel a, a pilot to wear an emergency bailout rig uh, because of the door modification, Cessna 182s, 206s, and that like. Uh, you will hear many people who fly uh, Cessna caravans that, well, they don't need the rig because it's not regulated, it's not required. But I'm sure all of you in Australia are very familiar with the uh, premature deployment that took the tail off of a caravan and uh, the uh, aircraft was lost with uh, one jumper. Pilot had made a choice to wear an emergency rig uh, not long before the accident. And while he was delayed in exiting the aircraft because of a closed door, aircraft gone out of control, the door closed on him. He was able to get himself out pretty much at the last second. Uh, I take these stories uh, to, uh, to heart and uh, think about them all the time. How can it be done better? How could you prepare better uh, to uh, 
if you can't prevent the event from happening, how can you prepare better uh, for the situation so your reactions are instinctual and without a lot of deliberation necessary? Uh, so before my time flying skydivers was over, I, uh, even though I was flying Twin Otter mostly, uh, was actually working towards getting my own emergency bailout rig because I thought, well, if I'm going to talk the talk, I'm going to walk the walk too. Uh, things could happen uh, that a Twin Otter could be taken out. Uh, we've seen video of uh, premature deployments, uh, somewhat more rare uh, in a Twin Otter, uh, go over the tail, but it can happen. Uh, wingsuit jumps. Uh, if they don't exit properly. You know, they have struck the tail. Um, King Air 90s, King Air 100, uh, they have a tail that can be taken out by a premature deployment. And so I encourage every pilot now to have an emergency bailout rig, regardless of uh, requirement or regulation, and more with the thought of what's possible what's likely to happen and uh, be prepared. Um, if you're a jumper on jump run and there's a premature deployment, uh, a couple scenarios, the premature deployment happens in the cabin, the door's closed, obviously get control of the premature deployment. Hopefully it's just a pilot shoot and not a, uh, of the main and not a reserve spring loaded pilot shoot that can bounce away and uh, sneak out the door. Uh, but the first thing is to secure what has gotten loose in the aircraft. And I'm sure most drop zones will train that uh, at some point, but it's a good topic to bring up. If the door has come open and there's a premature deployment, get control of the premature deployment as best you can, if it's possible, get the door closed and having a discussion of what that command to close the door should be. Uh, a relay of information should go up to the pilot and back to anyone who might be near the door if the premature deployment doesn't happen near the door. If the person is in the doorway, and we've seen many instances of this on video and through uh, stories, if there's a premature deployment in the door, it may be best to get the jumper to continue and follow out the door so that uh, the deployment does not have a chance to envelop the horizontal stabilizer. Um, obviously, gear checks to prevent. Uh, premature deployments are key. If there's no pre premature deployment, you don't have the accident. Um, in the United States, uh, we had within one year at the same drop zone uh, that was running Cessna 82s, had two aircraft where the pilot had to bail out of the aircraft because it was uncontrollable and uh, use their emergency bailout rig. Uh, aircraft was lost, for, fortunately landed in a farm field. Uh, but that's really serious because I believe it happened about five or six years ago, uh, the two, two instances. Uh, it's a pretty rare thing that the pilot has to bail out. To have it at the same drop zone uh, within a year was pretty astounding. Um, Let's see. Staying on top of things, not being complacent, obviously always key. Uh, if the premature deployment goes over a part of the aircraft and they do not clear, the structure remains intact and they are in trail, uh, jumper in tow, uh, that is a really really bad situation and is probably gonna have to take a lot of discussion unless the aircraft goes inverted and the pilot can keep some control, uh, then a lot of talking needs to happen. And here's the discussion on hook knives. Now I'm 
don't know the regulation in Australia, whether they're mandated or not, but here's what I tell people. The pilot should always have um, a hook knife, a good hook knife uh, available at their reach because it may be the only one anyone can reach. Uh, each aircraft should have its own hook knife installed. Uh, each jumper should have at least one hook knife on them at all times. And I know some jumpsuit manufacturers would create a little pouch for a, a hook knife that literally looked about that big. And that's supposed to save you. In a stressful situation, you lose your fine motor skills and you're reduced to your gross motor skills. And I always had a hook knife that my whole fist could go around and it extended up with a good hook uh, over about you know seven, eight inches long. Uh, I may need to, need to reach out and hook onto something that needs to be cut. So having something that ends you know, just above your fist uh, may not help you much. I may need a little reach. So these are all important things. On a Cessna type aircraft, if there is a jumper in tow on the main landing gear, like Cessna 182 or a Cessna 205, uh, you really have to see what it is that is causing them to be snagged with the aircraft. Uh, if it's a harness, that can be a really tough call, uh, whether you start cutting on stuff. Now I have seen uh, jumpsuit booties snag. Um, I can't say that I've ever heard of a uh, wingsuit jumper being snagged up by the landing gear or some part of the aircraft. I've always just heard of them uh, kind of opening the wings too soon and having a collision with maybe the horizontal stabilizer, but it's certainly uh, possible and they have a lot of fabric that could uh, snag onto a lot of things. So. Uh, I try not to focus too much on the, you know, a tandem is hung up, a static line student is hung up, an experienced jumper is hung up. It's see what it is that is snagged, decide if it's something you can cut right away. Jumpsuit booty, no problem. Uh, tandem student uh, harness, it's gonna be a tough call, so you need to, make sure your pilots who may not be experienced jumpers themselves uh, may not have a tandem rating, but they need to know what they're looking at. They need to know what the gear is because it's in their aircraft. So what is okay to cut? What's not okay to cut? And if it's not okay to cut it, then you have to start considering landing with the jumper in tow. And that can be a really tough thing. Uh, we have had instances where a jumper uh, was in tow. The pilot could not reach uh, the jumpsuit that was snagged up on the uh, 182 step and had to land with the jumper uh, trailing behind the right uh, main gear. Fortunately, aerodynamics had the jumper laying back to earth and they landed in grass and pretty much the jumper just skidded uh, to a stop behind the wheel, uh, sore, tired for ha flying half an hour, stuck upside down behind a, a 182 wheel, but uh, was pretty okay. The problem becomes if the jumper decides they're gonna do something on their own, it, it's hard to communicate from being underneath an aircraft in tow and to the pilot who's on the opposite side of the aircraft. Um, it used to be all static line students, at least in the United States, were taught the signal of, I'm okay, I'm conscious, by putting both hands behind their head. And that, at least, is a hand signal to people still in the plane, okay, he's, he can participate here at least a little bit. Um, it also, putting your hands up here also means I'm not about to pull my handles. I'm not gonna deploy a reserve. I'm not gonna try to deploy a, a main if it's not already snagged up with the aircraft um, because you add that type of uh, drag and it can make the aircraft go out of control. Uh, so then you give people in the plane options, maybe some time. Um, 
if you're constantly struggling aerodynamically, you're going to wear out pretty fast. So you have to uh, remain calm. Talk at your drop zones about how long you may try to fix someone who's in tow. I can't shake them off. I can't cut them off. But I don't want them out there so long that they give up and just deploy a reserve trying to do anything to get themselves out of that situation. That can be catastrophic for everyone. And that happened in a Cessna 182 drop zone in Mexico where a tandem got snagged uh, by the uh, Y connector on a uh, student harness. And they were flew around for almost half an hour. Unfortunately, they decided, the pilot decided to descend to about 100 to 200 feet above water, which may seem like a good idea. Hey, it's water. But at that speed, water acts like concrete. Um, so you're better off stay high until you decide you need to land and you need to discuss how much time you're going to tow a jumper around before you, I've got to land this plane. It's your best shot and my best shot. And we're going to try to come up with a plan of a grass strip. You know, these are all things you should probably set forth in a pilot training manual. Uh, if this sort of thing happens, this is where you should go. This airport that we're based at may not be suitable for this, or this particular part of the airport is where you need to go if you have something like this happen. Obviously, you want to be in radio communication trying to get advice from experienced people on the ground who are removed from the situation enough that their stress level allows them to maybe come up with options where the pilot is, again, task saturated. Um, the uh, situation I was talking about in Mexico where they were flying at about 100 to 200 feet above water, the tandem master seemingly, um, I won't say give up, but decided that they needed to do something to extricate themselves from the situation, deployed the reserve, and they did not get loose of the aircraft. The aircraft went out of control and hit the water. And unfortunately, the uh, tandem student and tandem master uh, perished. So um, try to work on a, an amount of time where you decide, OK, we have to land this now. And everyone knows what to expect from each other um, without making a bad situation worse. And as actually I was driving back to my house, uh, here this evening for this talk, uh, thinking over the article I had uh, worked with um, Annette O'Neill on for Parachutist, I realized I had left out in a really important topic about jumper and emergencies. And that is weather. If the weather changes suddenly, what do you do? How are you going to communicate that or how can you get people on the ground on uh, radio communication to say, hey, you know that rain shower we've been watching for a while that seemingly didn't move, suddenly got closer to the drop zone and we see lightning. Hey, call it off, knock, knock it off. Uh, it's time to uh, land with the load and uh, skydive another, uh, another day or uh, later that day. I have been in that situation where we watched a rain shower develop. It didn't seem to move at all. The area over the airport property was all clear for hours. And again, during takeoff, during climb, I'm looking at this cumulus cloud that's seemingly staying away from the airport. As we turned on jump run and I'm given the green light to exit, the people on the ground saw lightning come out they saw a gust front coming out of the thunderstorm and never called. And I can't necessarily blame them, but I know that we had never talked about what to do. If you see something, you know, make the radio call, at least pass information, and then everyone is more informed. As I descended and saw the parachutes open and the tandems were open, 
I saw everyone backing up because the wind had picked up to almost 40 miles per hour. And many of them landed off the airport um, in really bad uh, terrain. And one tandem master broke his ankle, which, you know, I feel uh, responsible for um, because we didn't necessarily have a clear procedure set up and our judgment, we got lulled into, hey, we can keep going, we can keep going. And then it happens. The emergency doesn't ask your permission um, and self-evaluation has to come without uh, ego. And uh, we had to do a lot of soul searching on, on that one. Um, he healed, he's back in New Zealand. He's, he's doing okay, but uh, yeah, that sticks with you when stuff like that happens, uh, when we didn't do our best. Um, another jump run emergency you can have is, what if the aircraft stalls uh, during exit? If you have an aircraft that has the exit door at the rear of the aircraft, uh, it usually fixes itself if you leave. The center of gravity moves forward in the aircraft and uh, the load gets lighter, so it can help the aircraft uh, recover. Now, depending on the type of aircraft, uh, it may be a pretty dramatic uh, stall, or it could be fairly benign and just the nose comes down and you descend straight ahead. Uh, we've seen videos over the years of King Air 90s uh, stalling in jump run, um, the PAC 750, uh, has a very specific stall recovery. If the pilot feels a stall coming on, uh, they have very definitive uh, control inputs they need to do to uh, prevent that from happening. I've had 11 people on the outside of a uh, twin otter uh, that I didn't know was going to have 11 people on the outside in their group. And uh, rode the buffet and got concerned about a stall, but the Twin Otter is a pretty good performer. We have seen King Air 90s that seemingly are flying at the correct air, indicated airspeed suddenly go out of control. And we had that in California also with a pilot uh, where there's a lot of backstory to this one, but uh, turning to jump run without the exit door open uh, stalled the aircraft and began a spin. And uh, the load organizer clearly in the video calls for everyone to stay put. Um, if you can grab a seatbelt, you know, uh, try to uh, secure yourself. Obviously, you're not going to be able to belt back in, but if you can at least prevent some load shift, because you don't want everyone going to the back of the plane, causing the stall to get worse. If you can just stay where you are, allow the pilot some time to try to recover the aircraft, uh, you're likely to have a positive outcome. I believe after three revolutions in the spin, uh, they said, okay, this is not getting better. The door came open and uh, some people started to exit. Right as the pilot did an improper procedure to spin recovery and feathered both engines, um, this stressed the aircraft and the right horizontal stabilizer uh, ripped off the plane. So now you have an aircraft that's close to stall and spin, has partially recovered from the spin, but not fully, now has a structural failure and still has jumpers inside. And the uh, second uh, video from inside that aircraft showed a lot of people pinned to the floor. Um, there's really no advice on how to crawl your way out of a plane when you're pinned to the floor other than do whatever you can. Uh, at that point, uh, there's no control of the aircraft. The door is open. It's time to leave um, and, and hope for the best and hope that the situation improves by your, by your leaving. Uh, that particular pilot had, uh, also had an accident in a 206 that people were seemingly unaware of, uh, had been told that he wasn't supposed to be flying that King Air, but the drop zone used him anyway. 
And then after that accident, he got hired by another prominent drop zone in California and crashed a twin otter ripping off uh, a wing. So knowing where your pilot's coming from and their history can also be just as important uh, to giving a lot of thorough proper training uh, to make them make experienced jump pilot before they fly their first load on their own. So, you know, there can be a lot of what ifs, what ifs. Um, and over the many years I've been in the sport of skydiving and talking to people, uh, you can also get a lot of, well, if you just give me a thousand feet, I'm out. And that may not be a good thing because if you're in a Cessna 205 or let's say a P206, where the exit door's in the front under the wing, not in the rear like a U206, the center of gravity shift that happens from someone exiting the front can actually make the situation worse for the pilot. Uh, where we saw that happen in a uh, crash in Ohio. Um, they had an engine failure on takeoff, reached an altitude between six and 700 feet. Pretty much you're a glider, get the nose down, land in the farm field that's straight ahead of you. However, the door came open, a jumper came out of the door, six to 700 feet off the ground, deployed their main parachute and did not get it deployed before uh, hitting the ground. Another jumper attempted to leave, uh, but never got anything deployed. And because it was a front exit door on a Cessna 205, the center of gravity was out the aft limit from the start, but it went further out the aft and the pilot had no chance of getting the nose down. So that is a situation of, uh, making a bad situation worse. They actually ran out of gas on takeoff. They had not refueled properly. But again, aircraft can glide, get the nose down, do emergency procedures properly, know what altitude you're at to begin with, and have a clear understanding of what are people gonna do at different altitudes. And it may be situational to who you have on board. Is the aircraft out of control? Okay, you've got to act. A stall, a uh, without spin, uh, an engine failure, get the nose down. It'll fly even if it's still descending. It's in control and you have a better chance for survival. So I see uh, we've got about 15 minutes left in this hour. Um, I can open it up to questions. Um, we can talk about a different topic for a while too. Um, like I said, I've been running this website for about 20 years and uh, it's been a labor of love. Uh, I appreciate the influence that I've had, especially with uh, United States Parachute Association in uh, putting out information on uh, jump plane accidents, training, uh, getting more people on board that while USPA doesn't regulate pilot training, uh, they kind of have always had the idea that, well, that's FAA. Um, we all need to be in this together and information is key. Uh, training, talking like this is free. So it's all our, just our time uh, and we can uh, learn a lot and I'll do better. Uh, obviously we have done better from where we started in the late United States to where we were last year, but we can still improve because we're always going to have that next generation of jump pilots that we need to inform on not only the what, but the why of what we do. So I'll just open it up for questions. Thanks, Chris. Um, Mark, have you got anything to add anyway? Uh, no, I mean, I think from the ABS perspective over the years, we've, uh, we've looked at a lot of incidents uh, around the world as well as ones we've had ourselves and we've worked proactively to put procedures in place and training and uh, what have you to address a lot of those concerns that we've discussed. Um, but I'd be interested in Chris's view whether he sees any gaps in our system or whether he's had a look at our, our manuals and procedures to, uh, to engage that. Whether we're ahead of the game or behind the game. It's been interesting uh, talking to people from Australia how 
they have instituted, for lack of a better term, maybe a type rating for uh, or a licensing of jump pilots, where here in the United States, there is no required training to our regulations. Uh, if you're rated as a commercial pilot, uh, it's up to the drop zone to train you. Uh, they consider that you must be an informed participant and it's in your best interest to get all the information you need. Yet we've had instances where um, things have happened and you just say, how could you have done that? We had a Cessna 182 accident uh, a couple years ago in the, in the Southeast United States where the fuel cap was lost for some reason. And instead of getting another fuel cap before flying another load, they used tape over the hole. And then they had a engine failure on the next takeoff. Will a license prevent that type of accident? Will a, a more thorough checkout? You know, that's always debatable. Um, I know that Australia has taken the uh, um, direction of having a more strict training course. And, you know, I like that. Uh, I don't necessarily like uh, the cost that I've heard associated with it, but you know, every system is gonna have a balance and uh, it, it'll uh, settle itself out. So I've tried and many other people in the United States have tried to make available the information that would be incorporated in a training program like that, uh, but it is somewhat self-seeking. Uh, people do have to take the time to set up the, the uh, course themselves. And that's why we provide a, uh, a, a training syllabus uh, that can be expounded on for the individual operation. And we also provide a uh, written test that can be uh, tailored to a specific operation. So basic information that you have to start with at any place you fly. Okay. Um, Somebody's message came up about a question. I wasn't sure if that was you, Luke. Yeah, that was me. Just in regards to the accidental deployment inside an aircraft, um, you mentioned about closing the door. Is that a someone's reaction to seeing the accidental deployment of the, like either the pilot chute or the reserve, uh, basically close the door to stop them following it out? Or can you just clarify that for me? Right. If you were to have a premature deployment that's not right next to the door. Nothing has started to go out the door. Uh, whoever's in charge of the door operation, you know, someone who's right next to it, they may choose that their course of action is to get the door closed while other people are trying to contain the premature deployment. And I've had premature deployments where a pilot chute fell out of a pouch, okay? And it was a twin otter and it was right behind my seat so obviously very little risk of going out the door, but someone calls shoot uh, or premature deployment, the people closest to it control it. The door gets closed as a response to any um, abnormality in the aircraft. And then we talk about it and figure it out. We can board the jump run and settle things out. Um, if it happens close to the door, you know, it's gonna be, all right, is it already starting to go out the door? Continue. Uh, get them away from the horizontal stabilizer if possible. Um, you know, I, <laughs> way during our uh, attempts at the world record in 2000, when I actually was a jumper participant in the 300 ways, um, I was picked up in a truck, sitting on the, the edge of the truck with my buddies and my arms around each other, and someone keyed a uh, CB radio and it caused my Cypress to fire. I had a premature deployment on a truck going 60 miles an hour. The spring-loaded pilot chute bounced off my friend's face, and the guy right behind him just happened to reach back and snag it. At the same time, the guy who was directly across from me grabbed me by the front of my harness and th threw me down to the, uh, to the base of the truck <laughs> and before I even knew what had happened. Um, I mean, it happened just like that, but that's why we keep our eyes and ears out looking at our buddies as much as we may be paying attention to our own gear. So make sense, make, answer your question. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Thanks.
another question here, Chris from TC. Um, do you want to clarify what you're asking, TC? Just it says my question is descent profile. Uh, are you saying if you descend with the airplane, you didn't jump? I'm not sure. No, I'm talking about after the load's been let out and the pilot's descending. Um, we lost the 206 here earlier this year um, where he ended up having an engine failure and crashed short of the field. Um, one of the things Mark and I have talked about and other experienced pilots is uh, briefing the pilot to stay within gliding distance of the field if possible. Absolutely. Um, any number of things can cause an engine failure during descent. Um, and so trying to dissect, okay, how do we prevent this type of engine failure or this type of engine failure? It's like, okay, let's just say there's an engine failure at any point during the descent. How do you fly your pattern? And um, what do you do if it does fail? If you're able to always stay within gliding distance of the airport, good. However, you do have to consider other traffic that may be entering the traffic pattern at your airport and entering at traffic pattern altitude on the 45 degree, you know, um, see and avoid uh, was always, you know, the basic uh, idea of traffic pattern entry. And if you do that at the right altitude, you may not be able to glide to the runway at some point. Um, once I got on downwind, I pretty much treated it as a uh, uh, no power landing and I flew my, the rest of my pattern with that in mind. Um, and it may be just as you level off is when you realize there's no power. So then you have to decide and it's up to each drop zone to understand the topography around that drop zone. Um, you know, if the engine failure happens here, we want you to go here, you know, here's your out. Um, there should never be a doubt or a question as to where to go uh, if there's a engine failure. The second part is, okay, how do you teach your pilot to know where they're gonna land because the engine's out? And I'll tell you on a piston aircraft, uh, the glide uh, is a lot steeper than you can actually practice with an operating engine, uh, even just at idle. Uh, if it really fails, it's a steeper uh, descent. and they may be trying to just make the picture the same as every other landing they've done. That might be at idle, but that's not gonna work this time. And we've talked about that in the United States several times about patterns and, and the lack of emergency training that may happen during a season. It might be talked about, it might be referenced, you might even see some of it at the beginning of a season or when you're brand new as a jump pilot, but you flew 500 loads, you know? And now the situation suddenly is different. Are you going to pick up on the clue? All right, I need to not descend just like every other jump plane descent. All right, if, if you pick up on the fact that you have a failed engine in higher altitude, all right, time, just level off, go to that best glide speed. Now that I have time, now I can decide where I'm going. We had several instances where jump planes uh, jump pilots with engine failures um, landed downwind because they were just like descending at the same speed. They knew they had an engine failure, but they descended at the same 140, 120 knots and they put themselves in the corner. They got rid of the altitude as fast as they could because, well, that's what they did on every other load, but they're in an emergency. The engine has failed. Slow it down, get the best glide, do what you can and then evaluate your situation make sure that you've done your engine failure procedures. We saw this in Dubai, the caravan crash there, California, uh, a few others where the pilot never feathered the propeller and they caused themselves to lose time uh, because they were forced to descend fast. So convincing a pilot to take a breath, a really deep breath, if they have a stopwatch on their watch, start the stopwatch. And that just at least breaks the uh, thought process of panic, of startle. And then it begins, the, the higher functioning of the brain starts to come back and maybe they start making better decisions. 
but everyone's going to be startled in that situation. It's like, oh crud, am I going to get in trouble? Did I cause this? Is my boss going to be mad? You know, that should be a discussion as part of the training of any new jump pilot. Okay. We need you to be safe. If you get startled, we're going to talk about what happened afterwards, but we want to be able to talk to you. We don't want you to panic, end up in a bad situation and dead because we can always come back and see what happened later. Uh, so if you, as a manager or a drop zone owner, you can direct the thoughts of your new pilot to helping them out uh, with that thought process, you know, that'd be a good thing to do. Yeah, TC, with regards to uh, uh, not having a landing area available, it, it's a bit of an old school mindset in single engine aircraft. You're always looking for the next place to put it down. Um, but I think there's definitely a failure, a failure in the training these days in flying schools where there's not much emphasis on that, that logic. Whereas you took to any old bush pilot. I mean, I, I was taught by old A pilots and stuff in the 180s and you go flying cross country and you'd avoid flying over a heavily forested area where you couldn't see somewhere to put it down. Um, you'd even be looking at dirt roads and you'd be glancing at them saying, can I make that if I have to? And that's just normal on route flying in single engine. And, and that same logic needs to apply to jump pilots in single engine aircraft, whether it's a caravan uh, or a piston, you've got to have that same mentality. There's only one engine here <laughs> and for any millions of reasons it could stop and I've got to be ready to put it somewhere. So. Uh, that's something that needs to be ingrained in pilots from day one when they learn to fly. And, and unfortunately, I think uh, they uh, maybe they forget that because it wasn't emphasised enough early on in their, in their training career. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, we just Hey, we filled an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great, Chris. That's, that's awesome stuff. Um, this isn't really a question, but just a, another comment to throw into the mix. If it's at night time, it's all a, a different story too. <laughs> yeah, actually that is a part of uh, my website that I'm developing right now. Uh, after 20 years, I kind of turned to some people that have supported me and said, I've never written anything about night loads and emergencies and what to do. And it's like, oh crap, <laughs> it's a big gaping hole. So, you know, we just had a, a report come out on a, uh, Cessna 182 that they decided to strap pyrotechnics to the left main gear and it exploded causing a hole in the left uh, wing tank caught fire burned the pilot everyone got out but the plane crashed through someone's house yeah, so, yeah. you know <laughs> holy cow did we really have to explain test stuff get approval before you use it <laughs> you know yeah. If we subtract out accidents like that, our record goes gets really good. <laughs> uh, certainly, well, night brings a whole new element to it. I've done a lot of single engine flying at night uh, around the country, and you, there's always an element of uh, <laughs> what am I going to do if something happens? Because you just it's pitch black out there. Um, but from the jumpers perspective, uh, landing out at night is certainly problematic. I don't think people think enough about then night jumping, uh, in my view, uh, particularly the equipment, I, got, I had to land out one night on an FX79. I landed in a truck car park between two trucks uh, on the gravel. You know, there could have been power lines. I don't know. That was the only spot that was lit up, you know. I shouldn't have been taking a canopy that size on a night jump, you know, for goodness yeah. sakes. Um, <laughs> and people don't think about this, right? They jump that canopy all the time. Well, that's fine by day. <laughs> but, you know, you don't want to be doing a a fast landing at night, off drop zone, you know, it's, uh, it's just, there's a, everybody needs to step up, change their whole logic of uh, risk management when they come to the night chapter. Yeah. All right. Um, Chris, thank you so much, mate. I really appreciate it. Um, great talking to you. Good to see you Good again. Good to see you. Yeah. You um, that was invaluable information. Very, very good.